The picture that the world receives from the followers of Muhammad paints him as a valiant, honorable, just and fearless warrior. What is the reality and what are the facts? The greatest threat to the exposure of the falsehood of the Quran, our knowledge of the Quran, hadiths, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament and related scriptures and history. As we have repeatedly shown and will continue to do so in our series, that without a doubt, it is by divine justice that the very hadiths that explain the Quran to the followers of Muhammad are the very ones which completely and utterly destroy its alleged divine origin and its veracity, as we shall prove yet again in this chapter. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 4.54 narrated by Abu Huraira. The Prophet said, by him in whose hands my life is, I would certainly never remain behind an army unit setting out in Allah's cause. By him in whose hands my life is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause and then get resurrected, and then get martyred and then get resurrected again, and then get martyred and then get resurrected again, and then get martyred. Muhammad in his own words admits that he did not fight in most of the raids that he either initiated or conducted. He preferred death in jihad than life, as long as it was the death and jihad fought by his followers and not by himself. What a spineless coward. He sent his simpleton and gullible followers to their demise with promises of booty and rape if they survived and unlimited sensual and sexual pleasures in his perverted version of paradise if they got slaughtered. With such promises, they could not go wrong whether dead or alive. Then the brave Muhammad who did not fight boasts of how he would have preferred to die in the way of Allah in jihad again and again and again. Ibn Ishaq 373, the apostle wore two coats of mail on the day of Uhud, and he took up a sword and brandished it, saying, Who will take this sword with its right? Muhammad did not get into the pitch of battle, but retired to the top of the hill surrounded by his bodyguards. That is why he gave his own sword to someone else to fight with. It is obvious that Muhammad was no Alexander the Great, nor a Julius Caesar but a pure coward who had to wear two coats of mail even though he had no intention of exposing himself to danger but relying on others to die for him, his ideas and his fraudulent promises. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 4.276 narrated by Al-Bara bin Azib. The Prophet appointed Abdullah bin Jubair as the commander of the archers who were 50 on the day of the battle of Uhud. He instructed them, stick to your place you should not leave your place till I sent for you. When the infidels were defeated, by Allah I saw the women fleeing, lifting up their clothes, revealing their leg bangles and their legs. So the companions of Abdullah bin Jubair said, The booty, O oh people, the booty, your companions have become victorious. What are you waiting for now? Abdullah bin Jubair said, Have you forgotten what Allah's apostle said to you? They replied, By Allah, we will go to the enemy and collect our share from the war booty. But when they went to them, they were forced to turn back defeated. At that time, Allah's apostle in their rear was calling them back. Only twelve men remained with the Prophet, and the infidels martyred seventy men of us. Then Abu Sufyan, the leader of the unbelievers, asked three times, Is Muhammad present among these dead people? The Prophet ordered his companions not to answer him. The hadith and their history amply prove that those who converted to the followers of Muhammad did not do so for sublime spiritual reasons, but for booty, plunder, rape and enslavement of the wealth, hard work and the fruitful produce of other peoples. Sahih Muslim Hadith 4413, narrated by Anas bin Malik. It has been reported on the authority of Anas bin Malik that when the enemy got the upper hand on the day of the Battle of Uhud, the Messenger of Allah was left with only seven men from the Ansar and two men from the Quraysh. When the enemy advanced towards him and overwhelmed him, he said, Whoever turns them away from us will attain paradise or will be my companion in paradise. A man from the Ansar came forward and fought the enemy until he was killed. The enemy advanced and overwhelmed him again and they repeated the words, Whoever turns them away from us will attain paradise or will be my companion in paradise. Another man from the Ansar came forward and fought until he was killed. 
This state of affairs continued until the seven Ansar were killed, one after the other. I would like our listeners to remember that I assert again that it is by divine justice that the Hadith invariably and repeatedly expose Muhammad's true characteristics for all to study. The gutless but self-declared jihadi Muhammad pretended to be among the Muslim dead and would not answer Abu Sufyan's plain and clear challenges. As usual with Muhammad, he expected others to expose themselves to danger. Any fair-minded and inquisitive person would ask the following questions. Why was not Muhammad at the forefront of the battle instead of being at the rear? Why did he give his own sword to someone else to do the killing with? Why did he wear two coats of mail, especially since he had no intention of fighting? Why did he not fight to defend his position, but begged others to die for him? Why did he pretend to be dead if he believed he was the messenger of Allah and that Allah was on his side? Why, at the very end, did he not answer the challenges of the leader of the Quraysh, but expected others to do so? Can any follower of Muhammad answer these simple questions? Ibn Ishaq 380. When the enemy hemmed Muhammad in, he said, Who will sell his life for us? Five of the Ansar arose. They fought in defense of the apostle, man after man, all being killed. Even though Ibn Hisham had edited Ibn Ishaq's version of events by taking out items that were not complementary to Muhammad, even so, the story as depicted shows an extremely craven and unprincipled man who would send any number of his gullible and unsuspecting believing followers to certain death without lifting a finger to defend himself. Ibn Ishaq 381, Abu Dijana made his body a shield for the apostle. Arrows were falling on his back as he leaned over him until there were many stuck in it. The first man to recognize the apostle after the rout, when the men were saying the apostle has been killed, was Ka'ab bin Malik. According to what Al-Zuhri told me, Ka'ab said, I recognize his eyes gleaming from underneath his helmet. And I called on the top of my voice, Take heart, you Muslims, this is the apostle of Allah. But the apostle signed to me to be silent. Muhammad, who was pretending to be dead, signaled to him to be silent because he did not want his victorious enemies to know that he was still alive and may attack him again. Believers and unbelievers, please remember that all these ahadith were not written by the enemies of Muhammad, but written by the followers of Muhammad, and they are telling the facts as they saw them at the time. It was Muhammad who ordered the murder of Ka'b al-Ashraf, and Asma bint Marwan, both of them poets, the former 120 years old man and the latter a woman with a suckling child who criticized Muhammad's slaughter of the Quraysh leaders at the ambush of Al-Badr. It was Muhammad who always had others among his followers to do his dirty work just like the modern heads of the mafia crime syndicates. Ladies and gentlemen, when the ahadith are studied carefully, they single-handedly help obliterate and destroy all the myths of chivalry, bravery, compassion, intelligence, knowledge, veracity, miracles, etc., that were later concocted by the thousands on behalf of and heaped upon the undeserving persona of Muhammad.